So we could just start, Tracy Dolan, by um, introducing you as Vermont State Refugee Director. And that is a state agency, is that right? So I'm in the Agency of Human Services. Right. And within that agency, this is an office within that agency. So it's the, um, the State Refugee Office, and it's within the Agency of Human Services of the state. Okay, that sounds good. And um, if you have your laptop on your lap, it moves when you move, right. so just so you know, just so okay. still. Um, so Tracy Dolan, as the state refugee director, you are responsible for welcoming our newest residents or, to the state. And um, tell us just quickly the brief of the state refugee office, because it, it is, uh, I wouldn't say wide ranging, but it's broader than one might at first imagine. Yeah, well, you know, it's a small office. It's me and a refugee health coordinator. And it's a little, um, it's interesting in that we have refugee resettlement agencies and they do the day-to-day -day work of welcoming refugees, providing those direct services. The office is responsible for overall coordination of private and public resources, making sure that they're connected and then overall assuring that the services happen for uh, refugees arriving in Vermont. And we also receive state funding through our office and then grant that funding out. So we monitor those activities as well. And then I would say another piece of it is really an important communication piece, making sure people understand what refugee programs are, the benefit to our state of receiving refugees mm -hmm. and, um, and the humanitarian aspect and the importance of having a refugee program in Vermont. Now you have quite a lot of international experience, I think, that brings you to this position, am I right? I do, yeah, I have a lot of public health experience, which I find very helpful, and overall international experience. And the folks who are coming to Vermont in 2022, um, I think we all are generally aware that there are Afghani refugees, but can you just describe the profile of, of the families that are coming to our state this year? Sure. Um, so uh, in this fiscal year 2022, you're right, a lot of our refugees will be Afghans. And, um, and that's, of course, due to the crisis that was created when uh, the US withdrew um, from Afghanistan. And we saw a lot of people suddenly needing to leave because the Taliban stepped in. And so a lot of folks who had worked with our military or worked in the humanitarian field, worked in um, uh, journalism or with any of our organizations, they were all at risk um, because they were seen as enemies by the Taliban. And so they uh, suddenly were at risk and needed to leave. And so a lot of them um, were not uh, yet granted uh, special immigrant visas, which would be a visa which would allow you to leave in a more orderly way, come to the United States, you have a visa. So instead, um, the government uh, moved a lot of people directly to a status called humanitarian parolee, which really allows for us to have that rapid movement of people into the U.S., not so rapid that we weren't able to do security checks. So everyone had, of course, security vetting. So what you're seeing is Afghan families, many of whom have had some kind of connection with the U.S. military and their extended families coming in, uh, well over 60,000 at-risk Afghans were evacuated, and many of them landing at military bases here in the U.S. where they waited, they were vetted, um, they were given um, their vaccinations, including COVID vaccination, they were screened, and eventually then getting placed with resettlement agencies all over the country. And how was it decided how many families would come to Vermont? Sure, I can actually just back up a little bit and explain how that works in general. So, uh, with refugee resettlement, the government of a state doesn't necessarily determine how many will come. We certainly coordinate, but it's really the refugee resettlement agencies that say, hey, this is how much we think we can take. This is how many we think we can take in terms of capacity. And then they work with my office to say, does that make sense to you based on what you know about the state and where the government is and where our services are? So before the Afghan crisis, our plan was to take 300 refugees this year. And then with the Afghan crisis, the Afghans were placed in a slightly different category. And the request was how many Afghans can you take in addition to what we hope are the other refugees as well. And, uh, and they were gonna come very quickly. 
as opposed to a little at a time over a year. And so we have two agencies here in Vermont. We have USCRI in Chittenden County, and we have a new agency in Brattleboro called ECDC. So eventually USCRI said, we think we can take up to 160 Afghans and ECDC said we can take up to 100. So right now, our goal is to settle 260 Afghans in Vermont, um, but likely we will probably go higher than that if we're able to continue to find housing, continue to find employment. And then of course, other refugees are coming in, probably not in the numbers that we originally thought, because the Afghans in some ways are, are replacing some of those numbers with the efforts of the State Department. And so we will see other refugees. I, I think we just received a family from the Congo um, last week, um, but we will see uh, other families as well. And so part of your brief is to make this transition safe and welcoming. And I wonder what goes into that. You mentioned housing, you meant, mentioned jobs. Just you know, a quick profile so people understand how this transition works for families coming into Vermont. Sure, yeah. So families are assigned to an agency before they arrive. So the agency knows they're arriving and a refugee resettlement agency will pick them up. And the refugee resettlement agency is provided some funding and required to do some really basic things, but of course, many of them go beyond that. They're required to pick them up, give them their first warm meal, um, assure that they can find housing, preferably longer term housing, um, help them get a job. They're required to give them English language learning because the refugees are required to take English lessons if they need them, if, they're, if their English isn't already um, proficient in order to access the services. And then refugees can get services that many other lower income Vermonters can get based on their income. So they can get Medicaid, they're also given a, a special domestic health screening when they arrive because they may have some unique health issues. They are signed up for um, food benefits, uh, like Three Squares Vermont or SNAP. Um, they also, uh, many of them receive reach up in the same way that other lower income Vermonters would. Um, if they can't, uh, if they aren't eligible for that, there is a special program called Refugee Cash Assistance, which is federal money that offers the same amount as you would get with reach up for up to eight months. Um, and then there are citizenship services often to help them. Um, if you show up and you are uh, with a regular refugee status, then you can start moving toward um, getting a green card or moving towards citizenship. But if you show up right now um, under this humanitarian parole status, as most of the Afghans are, not all, um, they are in a slightly different situation. They have two years on that status and all of them can work, by the way, they all arrive with work authorization. But during that two years, you need to apply for asylum. And, um, and that's a little unfortunate because that is a longer, more tricky pathway because once you get asylum, then there's a longer road to getting citizenship. So we're hopeful that the federal government may um, pass an adjustment to that um, to allow for a smoother pathway to citizenship. But in the meantime, right now, that is the pathway. And so they would be applying for asylum. So when a refugee comes, including the Afghans, they do have a variety of services available. There's a case manager assigned to them from a resettlement agency. There are volunteers that are often assigned to them. Here in uh, Chittenden, you have a volunteer, maybe called a family friend, who will do a lot of accompanying. Um, and you may have a host family. That's not so usual, but it is with the Afghans because so many came and it takes a little while to find housing. Up in Brattleboro, um, it's a slightly different case and we can go into that in a few minutes, but uh, they have a lot more of a community sponsorship model. Still similar in the services, but a lot more um, community members engaging in some of those key services. You know, it, I'm glad you mentioned the caseworker because even the kind of long living person who's lived in the United States for a long time doesn't have to always encounter these levels of bureaucracy that you're describing, which sounds really daunting. I mean, sort of at every turn, every aspect of your domestic life and your jobs, you there's a whole bureaucratic structure behind what you're describing. So do the case managers have enough 
time to work with all these folks? I mean, I know that the agencies have said we can handle a certain number, but it seems like a, a lot of work and a lot of support would be required. It is a lot of work. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, however, the state has all really also stepped in in making sure we make those pathways as smooth, smooth as possible. So, for example, at Medicaid, they have a special team that's trained that understands how to help sign up refugees because they might not have the paperwork that um, uh, a Vermont citizen, um, who, you know, who was born here might have. So there's some processes and people specially trained to make that a little easier. Even with the other benefits, um, we have folks who get an orientation at the state level so that they understand how to sign people up. And sometimes those um, applications might be expedited because uh, in this case, people might be arriving with almost nothing. And so we might need to move a little more quickly on their benefits because they don't have, uh, you know, a family um, background or any kind of social uh, network yet. Um, so it is, but it is a lot. Um, you know, and, and that can take some time, both uh, with our state partners and then, of course, the agencies like USCRI, AALV, uh, the Association of Africans Living in Vermont. While they don't do the initial welcome, they work with people later on when they've been here for about a year, but also, again, case managers and doing a lot of the same kind of work. So it is it can be time intensive. Some For some people, it can be very quick. For others, um, people may show up who've never been in an education system and might be illiterate in their own language. So it's not as easy as saying, well, we just have a translated version. Now, that may not work either if you don't have a, a literate population. Or people, we may give out computers in a lot of cases, you know, folks are given a Chromebook, uh, a lot of them, but they may never have used one before. So it, it is a lot of handholding. Um, it's, it's very gratifying work in that um, you know, you can often see a lot of bang for your buck early on, people getting a place, getting jobs, kids getting enrolled in school. I mean, kids pick up things so much more quickly. Kids can show up at school in kindergarten and not have any English and by the end of the year, they're speaking pretty well. Uh, so that, that's very exciting. So our schools are great partners as well. And what about the mental health needs of these families? I imagine they've been through something very difficult, leaving your home and then coming to a new place must, I could just see how that would be very challenging. It would, and, and so even that, so leaving your home and coming to a new place, but then often the reason behind leaving your home, they may have been persecuted or been on the run or hiding for a long time. So there's the trauma there. And then for these um, Afghan arrivals or for other refugees living in a camp for years, you know, um, many refugees are living in some sort of uh, displaced persons camp or in some limbo like that for 10, 15 years, you know, so just extreme instability for a long period and dire poverty in those camps. Um, in the case of the Iraqi um, uh, evacuees arriving here in the States, and then they stayed at a military base for months where they really couldn't leave. Um, no access to really much of anything. I mean, they were fed and, you know, the basics. Uh, so all kinds of trauma going on. And so when they arrive, um, they're given a, a, a health assessment and they're referred for mental health services if they need it. Of course, we also have people coming from countries where um, it is not part of the culture to have any kind of mental health service. The idea of mental health isn't a concept that necessarily translates. Um, and so you might uh, need to have a little time and trust and convincing to encourage people. Um, but we do have mental health supports, just like for any other Vermonter, uh, it's limited. You know, I, I don't know if you know anyone who's tried to get mental health services here, especially younger people, but there can be quite a wait time. Um, one unique thing that we do have that we're able to get people in more quickly is uh, a trauma response program connecting cultures, um, which does uh, provide services, especially to those who have gone through uh, violence in their own country and uh, you know, uh, survivors of, of rape and, and other uh, atrocities like that. And so that program um, is federally funded and, and that's a successful pro program. Uh, so we do have some, but we're really trying to build it up, make sure that more people get training and how to deal with people from other cultures um, and coming from a trauma that we might not recognize or be familiar with here in the US. 
You had mentioned Brattleboro as a, an interesting model for the reception of these families. Do you want to say a little more about what's happening in Brattleboro? Yeah, so our new refugee resettlement agency there is the Ethiopian Community Development Council. It's one of nine resettlement agencies nationally. So there are nine, USCRI and ECD are two of the nine. And, um, and although their uh, title says Ethiopian, they, um, they resettle and, and work with everyone. Um, and so they're in Brattleboro, they are piloting in Brattleboro and a few other communities, uh, something called community co-sponsorship. And so in the same way that USCRI has case managers and welcomes people, they have that, but then the community members come together in a group between five and 10 people and they raise money. And so they raise about half the money required when people first arrive. And their job is to help uh, bring people to appointments. Um, they play a, a significant role in those early days. And then often will stay, ideally, you know, this is a pilot, but often will stay connected, you know, for a full year or more. Um, and and they, uh, they, they raise funds to, in order to be part of that more formal network. They receive some extensive training um, and so that's a that's a great model. So again, it's meant to really ground people in the community and to get uh, for both the Afghans to feel that connection, but also for the community to feel that connection. I wonder what it. I mean, you you've raised this community engagement part for people that are watching this that might want to be helpful. How do they connect? And do they go to USCRI or? Yeah, they how can, can they be to helpful? Yeah. yeah, they can go to the USCRI website and there should be some information there or they can go to the ECDC website. I can send you information afterwards if it's helpful for you to put that up somewhere. Um, there are websites and there are email addresses unique to whether or not you want to volunteer or donate. Um, I don't have them right in front of me, um, but if you like, I can take a moment, look them up and say them on air now. Sure, well, we can, okay. um, we'll just put us, you just send them, we'll put a subtitle underneath them. Okay, that's great. Yeah, that's fine. So that'd be helpful for people to know where they can help, they can volunteer or donate, which sound like the two ways. And also, I imagine, you know, just quite simply, to be aware, it's easier in the spring, I imagine, to see who your neighbors are, because you may be, I remember we were living right across the street from some Armenian, an Armenian family who had come in the 90s. And, um, you know, they came out of their apartment in the spring and we're Armenian and they're Armenian. And we, you know, we've been friends ever since. And we were able wow. to be, you know, at least helpful in that Armenian kind of way. You know, you know what I mean? Like the um, social network yeah. kind of way. And um, so I think there are sort of, sort of simple ways that people can also help, even if it isn't overt. So um, just sort of in conclusion, Conclusion before we wrap up, um, I know that one of the um, areas that is in your bailiwick is the issue of human trafficking. And um, the people that, I mean, I read that in the description, and I'm not sure if I read that right, or people who have come here or have been trafficked here, and then you deal oh, with them. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, of the populations that are served through the refugee program. Um, human uh, victims of human trafficking is one of those subgroups. That's correct. Yes. And um, I know that in the legislature, they're considering some legislation around that. And I wondered if that was something you were aware of or could comment on. I'm not you exactly know, I, sure with what the legislation is. So I just wanted to check on that. Yeah, I would probably have to get back to you on that. Um, we have relatively few numbers coming through from the refugee program connected to that, but certainly, um, you know, sadly, uh, we have, of course, human trafficking in Vermont, and a lot of folks who are involved in human trafficking are Vermonters um, who um, are, you know, victimized uh, in part, um, mixed up with addiction, and um, you know, women, obviously, primarily women, young women. Uh, with huge power differentials, and um, and so so while you know it does touch on um, the work that I do, uh, the the refugee side of it, people who are trafficked here, um, is relatively minimal compared to the larger number who are engaged in trafficking, who are actually um, you know 
American born citizens, many of them. Um, and, and I think though, that's an important thing for people to understand because I think people think of trafficking and they think of a big moving van and you open it up and there's a whole bunch of, you know, um, desperate women inside or something like that. And that does happen, obviously, but um, a lot of it is a lot less glamorous and more, um, not that that's glamorous, but less, less foreign and a lot more homegrown. And I think that there are times when it may not pluck at people's heartstrings as much when it's not as dramatic a story, but it is a very um, uh, insidious and uh, terrible story. And it can often happen over time and it not necessarily in one very quick moment. And yeah. so I think we have to continue to have compassion for all of the harms that come through um, substance use disorder. And that is one of the drivers of human trafficking. So just in conclusion, maybe you could just restate for us the importance and value of refugees and immigrants coming to Vermont and why it is a benefit to the state and to the nation to have people come from different places to enrich our experience and our, our own opportunities. Yeah, well, you know, Vermont has a long history of welcoming uh, refugees here. We've had refugee uh, resettlement here for decades. And up until a few years ago, we were regularly um, receiving 350 plus per year from all over the world uh, from 2008 to 2016. Those were our numbers. That number dropped precipitously during the Trump administration. But they had a stated goal of really um, minimizing the refugee program, and they were successful in doing that. Um, a year and a half ago, we had maybe 23 people arrive. And so it had a huge humanitarian impact as well. Most refugees are never resettled. So um, what we do here in the United States is wonderful when we resettle people, but it is a drop in the bucket of the need internationally. Most of the help, and, and I know a lot of people say, um, well, why don't their neighbors help them? You know, If this is uh, Muslims looking for help, why aren't Muslim countries stepping up? Those countries do step up. 70% of resettlement happens in middle or lower income countries that are nearby these countries in conflict. So just really wanna highlight that. But back to your question, um, it, so many reasons we should do it. And I would say, and I think the governor would agree here primarily because it is the right thing to do because we are all brothers and sisters on this planet. And we would hope that if we were in dire straits and had to leave because of persecution, um, and needed a place for our children to go that somebody would take us in. People don't leave their country. People don't put their children in a boat unless it's safer than what they were running away from. And can imagine how scary it would be to put your child in a boat in the ocean and cross your fingers that they're gonna make it to the other side. So um, it's the right thing to do, it's the humanitarian thing to do. And then what do we benefit? Um, entrepreneurs, you know, we have an entrepreneurial rate that is actually higher among refugees and immigrants than it is among uh, native born Americans. So a really strong business drive and then a workforce that is excited to work. When the Afghans arrive here, one of their first things that they ask about, one of their first priorities is not what benefits can I get or how much cash can I get? It is where, where can I work? Where, what job can I get? I need to support my family and I need to send money back home. So a real drive to work um, so yes, we do need a workforce now more than ever. So many companies reaching out saying we have vacancies and we have a, a workforce that is ready. Um, so strong work ethic. Uh, and then all the enrichment that we get culturally, um, you know, it just makes it a, a more interesting place to live. Um, we learn and they learn from us. I mean, you know, when, when refugees come here, they learn something about our culture that they can benefit from. Um, you know, they may learn um, more about um, engaging and the outdoors in different ways or how to enjoy winter or, and you know, one thing I think about that we really can learn from a lot of cultures coming over. I think about um, our elderly and how other cultures engage with their elderly and how we engage with our elderly. It's just one example, but I see so much celebration of the elderly and keeping folks within the family and engaged. And I think, wouldn't that be a collective learning? for a lot of us with our Western culture of not seeing it that way. So there's just uh, so much to learn. There's the obvious ones with food and music, but then there's these deeper cultural connections around how do you engage with people? 
how do you have fun together? Um, how do you talk together? How do you respect each other? And so, so we, we get so much. And uh, I feel very lucky and blessed to have uh, this job. Well, Tracy, I can really tell that you get joy from this work and gratification. And as you said in the beginning, you, you don't think you're working any harder than other people. I believe that, but also the work that you're doing and with the partners is really essential and very pressing at this time. So thank you very much, Tracy Dolan, State Refugee Director for your time today and for the work that you're doing. We really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you. And I'll pass that thanks to all the partners doing the work. Thanks. Please do. Okay. Bye -bye. Thanks. Thanks.